Okay. So I'm going to give an illustration for you. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful and a classic proof, which I mentioned Pythagoras before, really old guy, but stuff he still proved was still true. Um, the little subheading I'd like you to make is about another old Greek guy, they did a lot of maths, those ancient Greeks, uh, called Euclid. Now, Euclid proved, Euclid proved that, you know prime numbers? You guys know what prime numbers are, right? He proved that there's an infinite number of prime numbers, that they'll never ever end, which is quite impressive, because scientifically you can't prove that, because you can keep on going and going and going, but there always might be a point where it stops. So, well, how do you know whether we got to that point or not? So, this is Euclid's proof for infinite primes. Okay. So, here's the statement we're going to try and prove. Statement. There is an infinite number. Of prime numbers. Now, I just want to pause for about 30 seconds. I just want you to think, how would you even begin on trying to prove such a thing? Um, when, you, when you see the word infinite, it's very intimidating because you're like, well, I can't just go, um, like, <laughs> it doesn't matter where you begin as so long as you go in some sort of straight line, you will, you'll never get to the end. That's what infinite means, right? So how would you go about proving something like this? How could you go about using a tool like this. Hmm. I'm going to ask you to help me start off because you actually have enough information at least to make the first step given this kind of setting, right? If this is the way that proof by contradiction works and this is the first step in any proof by contradiction, then what should be my first step or what was Euclid's first step? to try and prove this statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, OK. So the, you've got to be very careful with the um, choice of this. But the assumption that this is false right, is that we will assume there is a finite number right, um, that I can list these out. This is the assumption we're going to make. Um, now, in addition to that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to try and like state in mathematical terms what this might look like, right? So suppose these prime numbers I, I don't know how many there are, but suppose there is some limited number. I should be able to thinking back to what we thought about with sequences and series earlier on this term, um, I should be able to list them, shouldn't I? Uh, they're all primes, so I'm going to call, call them all like something like p1, p2 p3, etc. Now, when you see this dot, 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 with a sequence, if I just left it like that, what would that mean? It's, say it again? Okay, so these are the only ones I know about, but the dot, dot, dot indicates there are ones that I don't know about, and it just sort of keeps going. When you don't end, that means it's infinite. But I'm suggesting, I'm assuming that there is an ending, right? So I'm going to say, there is some nth prime number that is the last prime number in existence, okay? Uh, and that number might be huge. It might be billions and billions and billions. But the point is, it stops somewhere, and after that, no more, okay? So what I want to try and do is apply some logic that will take this assumption and show that something has gone wrong, show a contradiction with what I've assumed, okay? So here was Euclid's stroke of genius, right? What he said was, let, he introduced a new number. Let's call it uh, x. Let x be the product of all of these prime numbers. So p1 times p2 times p3. Multiply all of them together, all the way up until the last one. And then do something really ingenious with that, which is add 1. Now, remember what he's trying to do. He's trying to show that, in fact, this here, this assumption, is going to lead to a problem. So I'm assuming this is a complete list. right? If I can prove that it's not a complete list, then I've got a sort of self-contradictory situation. And that will be the proof. Okay? 
Now, let's, um, to make this a little bit easier for our brains to consider, maybe off on the side or with another color, if you've got it, I want you to imagine what this list could be. Suppose the list was this, three, five, seven. Okay, oh, I should have two out the front, shouldn't I? Okay, so suppose this was the entire list of prime numbers, right? Um, what would x be if this was the list? That's not a um, rhetorical question. What would actually x be? Uh, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 will be uh, 6 times 5, which is 30, times 7, which is 210. But then I add 1. Yes? So it will be 211. Okay. Now think about this with me. Think about what a prime number is. Like what defines a prime number? Um, what is a prime number, actually? What makes a prime number a prime number? Yeah, Carl. Okay, so the uh, very common and um, helpful definition uh, is a number that's divisible by 1 and itself because this is not a prime number. And I'll come to the reasons why um, in another lesson. Uh, this is a prime number according to your definition, even though that's a very good way to define it. Um, so we actually slightly tweak it and we say prime numbers are the ones with exactly two factors. Exactly two, not more and not less. It has less than two factors. Right? Um, now, if that's the case, if that's what makes a prime number, I want you to have a look at 211 for a second. Does 211 divide into 2 nice and neatly? It doesn't. Of course it can't because it's odd. What about into 3? It, it can't either. Now, I mean, the divisibility test for 3 is very easy. You, like, you look at the digits and that kind of thing. But you don't even need to do the test to know that it can't be divisible by 3. Can you tell me why? Because I added 1, right? I'd have to add 3 or 6 or 9 in order to get to the, the next divisible by 3 number. For the same reason, it can't be divisible by 5 or 7, right? So what does that mean about this number? What can you tell me about this number? 211 is either, and this is actually important, it's one of two things. As Emily suggested, Maybe it's prime, because it doesn't seem to divide by anything on my list. And remember, I said I have all of the primes, right? I said I've got them all, okay? So is it prime? If it's prime, my assumption was wrong. I don't have the complete list. Does that make sense? So I've already come into a problem. There is one other alternative. Um, 211 is a big number. Maybe it's divisible by something else, right? If it's divisible by something else, then what does that mean about this list? It's, it's still not complete, right? So this might be divisible by, yeah, like it might not be prime. 211 might not be prime. Um, but it might be divisible by some other prime. In both of these cases, I'm in trouble. Because both of these cases suggest that this list, as it clearly isn't, isn't complete. Does that make sense? So if this is what x is, how am I going to state this, right? x cannot be divisible by any of the numbers on this list. Cannot be divisible by p1, comma, p2, p3, etc., or pn, right? And the reason why is this ingenious thing that Euclid did. He did this. Right? That breaks the divisibility no matter what combination of numbers you put together. Okay? Um, that's why 211 can't be divisible by 2, 3, 5, or 7. And no matter how long this list is, I can always do this trick and come up with a new number that you always have a remainder of 1. Right? In fact, this is something we can say. There will always be a remainder of 1. Okay, therefore, therefore, x is one of these two possibilities, right? Is either a prime number itself or divisible by some other prime that's not on the list. And you can see, in either of these two possible cases for 211, 
or whatever number x actually is because it would be much larger, obviously. Whatever each of these is, my original assumption up here um, has just been contradicted, okay? So therefore, one more um, flow of logic, my original assumption is false, the assumption must be false, the list is not complete. And what's lovely about this is we can keep on playing this forever. It doesn't matter how big n is. n could be billions, trillions, Googles, Googleplex is long, and you can still do this trick. It might take you a while, but it will still be just as true as when we did it with just four numbers. Okay? So the list is incomplete. There is an infinite number of primes. Now, whoop, there we go. You can see how you can use this tool in a whole variety of ways. You can use it to prove something like uh, the angle sum of the triangle as well, fairly easily. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But the reason why you haven't been exposed to this before is because clearly this is a more direct way of doing things if it's possible, right? If it's possible, it's like, well, just let's just live in a world where things are true. That's a nice kind of world rather than um, having to do these obtuse kinds of ways of approach. However, there are simply things that you can't nice and neatly and elegantly do in this straightforward way. You have to appeal to this sort of reverse tool, but it's very elegant to do so because um, look at the things you can prove when you do. Okay.